three, two, one. What is up, everybody? Special edition of the Coast to Coast, or should I call it Coast to Post game podcast, right after a Tar Heel win over Louisville at home. We are brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt. Johnny T-Shirt, the place for all your Tar Heel gear. All right, all right. Come on in, get settled in as you are maybe heading home from the game, or maybe you have returned home from the game, or wherever it is you're consuming us. We appreciate you being here. This is a special edition of the Coast to Coast podcast being served to you as if it were a postgame podcast. I'm Joey Powell on InsideCarolina.com. Joining you after the Tar Heels get a 70 to 63 win over Louisville at home in a game that, you know, it, it's sounding like a broken record at this point, but it could not be truer than the truth. Uh, they had to have. Bringing in Sherelle McMillan, Sean Moran. Boys, a little different uh, shakeup this week. We didn't want to do a Coast to Coast on Sunday night considering they had a Saturday to, Sun to Monday turnaround, so felt like we'd put this together. So, Sherelle, how are you feeling joining us here on a Monday after a Tar Heel win? Good. It's a little different than Sunday, but it's Monday, so. Yeah. Sean, Happy how are you President's feeling, man? Day, everybody. Yeah, it's President's Day. I hope you all enjoyed your day off. If you had a day off, if you're like me, you didn't have a day off, so it's just another stinking Monday. Sean, how are you? I'm doing doing well since we're, we're talking after a win rather than uh... – <laughs> What could have occurred? The the beautiful part about this is, you know, we typically, as the schedule goes, we have about two games to talk about when we do a coast to coast, and uh, you know, this one by nature of having the Saturday Monday turnaround, we don't have to talk about what happened last Wednesday because I am over that, and I hope that the Tar Heels are over it as well. It looks as if they may have exercised a few of those demons tonight, uh, and then combining that with their win and getting that Q one win in Blacksburg on Saturday. Uh, who knows, maybe at least the taste has been, uh, has been made a little more palatable at this point. Sherell, Tar Heels really, you know, tooth, nail, gritty is the word I've seen the last five minutes on Twitter a lot. Is there another word you would like to use to describe them pulling out this 70 to 63 win over a, a Louisville team that just didn't seem like they wanted to be there, but while they were there, like, you know, what the hell, we'll, we'll dirty it up a little bit. Uh, not a word, but my favorite phrase in the world. It's that season, everybody. It is what is greater than how season. And that's where we're at with this UNC team. Like, who cares who shot what? Who cares who got how many turnovers? Who cares who didn't get enough shots in the second half? Uh, you know, all that stuff does matter. But in the end, they had more points than Louisville at the end of the game. So to me, that is the most important thing. That's a, a very uh, simplistic way to look at it. But I think we're at the point of, of the season where that's all you need to look at is the final score. Uh, so they pulled it out. And, and you know, they're, they're, they're getting good, uh, dare I say, to getting good, maybe turning a corner, dare I say. Um, in the You know what happens when we do this. Yeah. So uh, I did I know, it before the Pittsburgh game. I know exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> but, specific, but specifically in these close, you know, two, three, four possession games, They've been pretty good the last couple of weeks, really the last three weeks in those type games. Um, so maybe they, they've put something together and figured something out about how to close games. When you're a good free throw shooting team, you're able to do that. Um, and then players have short memories. And when you're able to put the rest of the game behind you and contribute in those final two minutes, you know, you're able to, to eke out a, what was a one position game and turn into a seven point win. Not the most uh, beautiful offensive display by the Tar Heels tonight. They did shoot uh, a tick under 50% for the game, 28% uh, going 7 for 25 from beyond the arc. Sean, I saw some things on offense tonight that are still the same old issues. Uh, bad shots, um, you know, rushed shots, shots where it looks like guys didn't really consider much else beside pounding the ball into the, the wood and then jacking up a shot late in the shot clock. But I also saw some things that were positive. They continue to use those baseline cuts uh, that are getting people out of the way. I've seen Caleb Love start to drive and dish with uh, kind of an authority that I think the Tar Heels have wanted him to use for the last two years. What did you see tonight on offense that made you feel like there are some positives to hang their hats on? I mean, I think, you know, with, with almost every game right now, there, there are definitely some, some positives, and that can come from, you know, Brady shooting, uh, Brady hitting, you know, that I'd say pretty clutch jump shot uh, towards the end, a uh, little, little step back. Um, and, yeah, you, you know, you did have, you know, at the end, Caleb driving to the basket, uh, RJ um, forcing turnovers and, and getting to the basket. But at the same time, you did 
especially in the last 10 minutes, you did have a lot of those possessions where all of a sudden the shot clock is, is under, you know, 10 seconds, five seconds, and they're forcing up a contested three. Um, you know, we saw that against Virginia Tech late. Luckily, Virginia Tech couldn't uh, hit anything that game. So, you know, it was more of a just a slugfest. But, uh, you, you know, at, at times they're, you know, when they're clicking and hitting threes um, and Armando has an advantage down low, things look really good. But, uh, you know, when when they're not, uh, you know, it's it, it, the offense has been getting bogged down and is looking to go one on one, which is not for the most part their uh, their strength. Defensively, uh, you know, I made the comment on Twitter, and, and I'm sure a lot of folks saw this as well. Hubert Davis said again that if guys can't play defense, they're going to come sit on the bench. And I'm paraphrasing, but that's what his his interview with the ESPN reporter was before he went to the locker room. Uh, I did see some what looked to be more in tune and more aggressive defense tonight out of the Tar Heels at times, but it still seems like there were stretches of the game where Louisville would, would just get jump shots. Sean, is there, is there a reason why North Carolina either looks really engaged or looks as if they don't want to put a hand up on the man? Is it miscommunication? Is it, uh, is it just exhaustion? What's going on that causes that feast or famine defense from them? <laughs> Uh, I mean, it, it's a, a great question, one we've been asking all year. I mean, the last two games they had, I think, against Virginia Tech was their sixth best defensive effort, and tonight was number 12 on the season. So, you know, it's it's better, you know, especially versus versus Pitt or, or some of the other games. So as a whole, it has been a little bit better. Um, you know, staying on the positive side, it did look like there was more communication, especially towards the end, um, you know, helping out on – pick and rolls of, of kind of, you know, not, not leaving either the driver or, you know, pick and pop wide open, but at the same time, you know, they're giving up wide open threes uh, or open, you know, open cuts to the basket uh, at key, at key points during the game. Um, and I think, I mean, that's just, it, it is who they are, unfortunately. Um, but I, I do think at least the last two games, the effort has been, been better as well as the communication but you know in general it's not an extremely strong defensive team ranked you know in the in the 80s right now uh, which is up from the hundreds when we last chatted but once again I think for them you know especially with with only playing one two subs max in the second half it's going to come down to communication and just keeping your man in front of you which I think they have done a better job job of uh, at least in the last two games. Sherelle, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to kind of leave this open-ended, which, you know, is usually in this format a blessing, but with what I'm getting ready to throw at you is probably going to be a curse. Uh, I'm looking at the minutes played tonight and I realized the Tar Heels, you know, 48 hours ago were on the bus driving back from Blacksburg. This is what I see in minutes played tonight. I see Armando Baycott with 39. I see RJ Davis with 36. I see Caleb Love with 40. The young man did not come out of the game. I would like you to expound upon that or maybe give us some hypotheses about why that is taking place. Well, it's what versus how season. And <laughs> I mean, do you really touche, man? You know, no, this is not disrespect to anyone who's coming off the bench, but if you're the head coach, you're starting the those five for a reason because you think they're the best players on the team or you think they provide the best chemistry or whatever, you know, reason you have. And you want to ride those guys for as much as possible. There are only three regular season games left. There will be plenty of time to rest in the off season, plenty of time to rest over the next five days. Uh, I think that was a key part of it. Yes, it was a 48 hour turnaround, but now they get a chance to, uh, you know, like Dewey said, get in the hot tub or ice tub tomorrow, take a couple of days off. They won't practice tomorrow and just get their bodies back and ready for the last week. Um, if they had a game, you know, if, they, if this was a, a Saturday, Monday, Thursday deal or something like that, maybe he he pulls back a little bit. But knowing they had five days off, I think was a big part. And then, frankly, just that he, he wanted to win the game and he felt like that was the best way to do it. I think that's the simplest, easiest, and, and probably most honest explanation um, is that those guys gave him the best chance to win. Nobody was in foul trouble except for R.J. Davis, and so they played heavy minutes. I love that we're all at the old point in our lives where we all kind of default to, and Dewey did this on the post game on Saturday, we're all kind of defaulting to, oh, they're young. They'll figure it out. They can yeah. heal. <laughs> <laughs> and they got, they do have five days though. They do have five days to, the, to get back, get, get themselves together and build their bodies back up. 
and it's not a long travel uh, trip towards Raleigh, as, as we all know. Um, something else I saw tonight that we've seen in these close games, uh, which may give Tar Heel fans and, and Inside Carolina subscribers a little bit of heartburn, but this Tar Heel team, and Jay Billis alluded to it a lot, this Tar Heel team, two for four from the line in the first half, nine for nine from the line in the second half, shot 84.6% from the free throw line. Shrell, I know a lot of people just absolutely railed on Roy Williams for not letting his team practice free throws enough or whatever you want to call it. But this team, if there is a clutch gene in them, shout out to LeBron James, if there's a clutch gene in these guys, is it at the free throw line? Yeah, we've always talked about what does this team do well that travels. We, we have that conversation pretty much after every game. What's something you can count on them to do at night in and night out? And I guess free throw shooting is, is becoming that thing. Caleb Love has iced, what, three games in the last yes. week at the free throw line pretty much by himself. The Clemson game, um, to some degree, the first Louisville game, this Louisville game, he hit a couple, um, and then Virginia Tech on, on Saturday. So um, they're learning how to close. Yeah, I just looked it up. They're six and three in games decided by 10 points or fewer this season. And they have won three of their last four. Um, games decided by 10 points or fewer that includes the two-point win at Clemson that includes the overtime win at Louisville uh, that includes tonight and that also includes at Virginia Tech so maybe maybe there's something there it's hard to trust this team still uh, but maybe that's that's a trend that's starting to go in the right direction yeah I'm definitely not jumping in the buy camp yet but you know wanting to point out the positives where we see them I agree with you maybe this is the maybe this is the thing that travels I appreciate you putting in those terms uh, Sean, I want to come back to you for one more thing. Again, as we look at the as as this team's full body of work, uh, Cheryl and I were talking before we started recording tonight. They are now um, a half game up on Miami in the standings, but that's kind of negligible because Miami has a game in hand. Uh, they are a full game ahead of Wake Forest right now and are in the top four, which would give them that coveted double buy in the ACC tournament. Uh, Wake would probably be who they would match up with if they got the four. Um, but Sean, is it just are we splitting hairs to decide whether or not this team should should try to get in the double buy or should they play for that fifth seed and and try to get an extra win against a, a 12 or whomever whomever it would be that they draw? Should they just win every game and, and not worry about the other stuff? Or are we actually probably thinking too hard at, in figuring out where they should where they should be seated? I, I would go with thinking thinking too hard, just given that this, you know, outside of what they've shown against Duke, they can you know, well, I take that back. I was going to say they could beat anybody. Um, I think they can. They obviously didn't show that against a Wake or Miami team on the road, but I think they can beat anybody and they can also lose, lose anybody, which is true from the pit game and almost losing the BC at home. So I think you want to avoid any, uh, you know, bad, you know, further bad losses. Uh, you know, there, there could be uh, someone's coming up over the next three games with either NC state or, or Syracuse. Um, so yeah, I think you want to get that double buy and if it's wake or whoever it is, then, then you play them. And once again, if you know, you can't, can't beat them in the tournament, then that kind of probably speaks, speaks for itself. So, you know, I I'm in favor of just trying to win two out of three, three out of three and, and see where they end up and then go from there. Cause ACC outside of Duke is just a, a very average uh, group at best. Yeah. All right. Take a quick break. I want to talk about Johnny T-shirt for a moment uh, and then we're going to get back and uh, do a quick, uh, quick recruiting, re, uh, I guess, refresh since we haven't done this. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about potential postseason standings. But what I do know is a, a team that is firmly not on the bubble, that is always going to make a championship run. That's Johnny T-shirt, right? Johnny T-shirt doesn't need net rankings. Johnny T-shirt doesn't need quality wins. Johnny T-shirt is a championship contender day in and day out because of the great prices, phenomenal selection, and their convenience. They're right there on East Franklin and Chapel Hill. They have a phenomenal website with quick shipping. Just everything you could possibly want as a Tar Heel fan. If you need the gear, go to johnnytshirt.com or stop by their store. Uh, Alumni-owned, family-operated, just great folks. They have been supporting Inside Carolina and Inside Carolina content for a long time. We want you to support them as well. So check out Johnny T-Shirt. Take a quick break. Let the national guys come in here, run some of their ads. We'll be right back to talk a little bit about, you know, what does the postseason look like for North Carolina? Does it look any clearer? And then we'll talk a quick recruiting update on this episode 
of the Coast to Post Game podcast on InsideCarolina.com. All right. Appreciate you guys sticking around. I'm Joey Powell, Sherelle McMillan, Sean Moran here, doing a nice special edition post game podcast with some coast to coast flavor on it. Uh, fellas, you know, it, it's really this time of year. And I swear to God, every time I hear the name Joey Brackets, I want to gouge my eyes out with a, a white hot poker. But his work actually becomes relevant now. It's not relevant in May, it's not relevant in October, but it's relevant now. And looking at what he said, and then uh, I have not seen Bracket Matrix update since the 19th, but it looks as if the Tar Heels got themselves back on, uh, to quote Jay Billis, the right side of the bubble after that win in Blacksburg. Sherelle, is there anything else that they can do besides try to win out, assuming they, that they don't win in Cameron, because there's just going to be so many odds stacked against them. If they beat NC State and they beat Syracuse, should that get them in regardless of what happens in the ACC tournament? I, I think so. We, um, it, you asked us this question about two weeks ago, and we said we think 13 and 7 is kind of, you know, really kind of the line. Mm -hmm. You'd like to be 14 and 6. 14 and 6 feels like a guarantee. But I, I just have a hard time knowing the metrics, knowing the ACC is down, um, knowing all that, seeing an ACC team who probably is in the top four or five in the conference, six games above 500, not making the tournament. That's mm -hmm. still new. And, and I understand we have new ways of measuring things and eye tests and some of those things are ancient and uh, aren't used anymore or as much. But that's kind of where I'm at because they, they got the much needed Q1 win. They did have the bad loss, but I think everything else kind of evens out. And you have to start to look around and say, OK, really, you know, are there are there 34 teams who are really or excuse me, 30 teams um, uh, at large who are really better than North Carolina, assuming they don't um, win the ACC tournament. That's kind of where I'm at. I, I think mm -hmm. they're, they're close, very, very close. Um, without the Pittsburgh loss, I would say a win at state probably does it. But um, now they're going to need to beat state and Syracuse to feel really comfortable, I think, going into um, Cameron. But if they do, uh, if they don't get the double by and then lose to Duke and then lose to a 12 or 13 seed, then it gets dicey again. Mm -hmm. So the best bet, you know, take care of state, try to take care of Syracuse. Win your first game in the ACC tournament, you're definitely in the NTA tournament. Yeah, you drop a you drop a, a game to a low seed in the ACC tournament, and that recency bias is going to absolutely haunt. Yeah, which is just as likely to happen as it is them, mm -hmm. you know, beating Syracuse or or beating Wake Forest or whomever. You know, you just don't know. Depends on how they feel that day. I do like what you said though. The NCAA has got to get sixty eight teams from somewhere, and I just I'm not sure that that the Tar Heels are are not one of those. Sean, a uh, little bit different, going to hypothesize. Tar Heels are twenty and eight right now, which you know. Hubert Davis wins 20 games in his first season as a head coach. I don't want to overlook that. Um, but saying that they win their last two conference games, uh, they lose to Duke, and then they go one and one in the ACC tournament. That would put the Tar Heels at 23 and 10. Do you think a 23 and 10 North Carolina team uh, gets in as whether it be a 9, 10, or 11 seed? 23 and 10, and, and yeah, I think I think they they get in. Um, you know, you could probably go up or down, you know, even, even if it was a little bit different or something happened, I think they still get in, but once again, it goes to, you know, last Sunday we were talking and I, I think we all just assumed that they were, you know, the one game to assume that they would win would be at home against Pitt and they got smoked. Um, so once again, even thinking that far ahead when they have a game at NC state where, uh, you know, they, they shot the lights out and had a, a relatively, a, you know, great atmosphere, fun game, easy going, uh, you know, if they miss a few early on and, it, and it's a tight game, you know, it, the, the, that could, you know, shift drastically in terms of, of that game. And then once again, Syracuse, um, UNC historically has played well against them, but last year uh, struggled uh, up in New York. So they could easily get hot. So I, you know, I, I just want them to win the, win the next two games and then, then can uh, figure <laughs> out, the, you know, what the projected record is. We'll sort all the other stuff out at that point. All right, Sherelle, I, I don't have, because this is not a traditional Coast to Coast podcast, <laughs> I do not have the reggaeton horns ready for you, but I understand there was some movement in the GG Jackson sweepstakes this weekend. Not going to do a full recruiting deep dive because this is not a regular Coast to Coast, but Sherelle, I'd be remiss if we did not have our weekly GG Jackson update. Fire away. So GG was at the University of South Carolina, his uh, hometown school. 
this past weekend for his official visit. That is the last scheduled uh, official visit. We'll, we'll see what happens. They have one more. He's taken four to Duke, to Georgetown, to UNC, and to South Carolina. Um, but it seems like that's it. And just uh, talking to folks around, it does feel like this one is nearing its conclusion, not imminent. And I know we always go back and forth about what imminent means, but not in the next couple of weeks, but I think pre uh, the NCAA uh, live recruiting period, which is the first week in April, I think we could be in line for a decision uh, by that time. So another, was that five or six weeks, basically another six weeks, um, anytime in there, I think you, you can start thinking about announcement. He's deep in the playoffs um, down in South Carolina. Actually, they played tonight. Not sure if they won, uh, but if they do, they'll play on Saturday for kind of the region championship. And then the next Friday night, they would play for the state championship. So he's a couple of games away uh, from a state championship. But um, Eric Bossi dropped by uh, last week for uh, exclusive chat with IC subscribers. So if you're not a subscriber, I would urge you to do that. And if you are, check out the thread. Um, there's two, there's one with the full content of everything Bossy said, and then there's one that we pulled out uh, exclusively what he said uh, about Gigi prior to the South Carolina visit. So it, it seems to be um, a, a three-team race at this point. Um, I don't think Georgetown at this point is a viable option. It seems to be South Carolina, Duke, and North Carolina. And just to reset for folks, you know, let them know what Eric Bossy's title is. Uh, National uh, uh, re Director of Recruiting for 24-7 Sports. And obviously, as highly ranked as Gigi is, Eric Bossy is going to have some insight into that as well. Cheryl, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask this one question before we get out of here. I did see some mention in a South Carolina newspaper publication about a potential reclass for Gigi. I uh, thought we had put that to bed. Is that bubbling back to the surface? Yeah, it keeps coming back up. Um, every time we ask, we're, we're told no. But then there are reports that say maybe. And uh, North Carolina will obviously take him as a reclass. And honestly, <laughs> if you look at North Carolina's projected roster next year, it, it you know, it's kind of a perfect fit. So <laughs> that might help them. You know, maybe that's something that they're pitching to him is that, hey, if you do reclass, we don't know what Armando Baycott's going to do. Um, you know, we don't know the status of Dawson Garcia moving forward. Mm -hmm. And Brady Manick is exhausted his eligibility. And Leaky Black could come back as a super senior, but they're not sure. So there's kind of a huge hole right now at the four. <laughs> uh, Jalen Washington, obviously a, a freshman who's coming in, and Will Shaver, who's already there. Uh, but there, there's an opportunity for playing time. So that could actually work in their favor. It usually doesn't, but we'll see on this one if that were to happen. All right. I appreciate that. Fellas, going to put a nice little cute frilly bow on this. Sean, is there anything you'd like to throw up before we get out of here tonight? No, I mean, the, the one thing was I did love that fast break to Caleb Love to Leaky Black with the Leaky dunk. Dunked. That was, uh, that, it was a, you know, <laughs> it was an aggressive dunk and it was a beautifully run fast break, which we, we haven't seen a lot of this year. I love anytime you're in a two on one, you get to put that one defender on skates and they, they certainly did. Cheryl, anything you want to add before we get out of here tonight? Two things. Um, North Carolina was, I think, 355 in uh, turnover percentage or, or forced turnovers coming into the game and had nine steals. So that's a big deal. Uh, we talk about R.J. Davis all last season. I feel like we're not talking about him enough this season. <laughs> the game tonight really changed, I think, when he kind of took over and took the ball into his hands. Um, his line ended up being 16 points, um, two assists, zero turnovers and three steals in 36 minutes. So Shouts to him. I, I think he's playing really, really well. You can see the maturation in him. And then finally, my favorite set that we look at every single week, conference only defense. There are only three conference games left. So North Carolina's played 17 conference games. And last week when we last talked, I believe they were in fifth in conference only uh, defensive efficiency. Any guesses as to where they are after tonight's game? They're probably back to third. They are third. In that the hurts conference. my face. I, I can't. I can't so, get my, my normal human yeah. <laughs> mind around that. I, I don't understand it. Maybe we can uh, one day we can get Adrian Atkinson on to, to give us a deep dive. But the metrics say that they are the third best defensive team in the ACC, in ACC play this season. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you know, it is, there's, there's stats and there's damn stats and statistics and lies. And I don't know. I just, <laughs> I just butchered like four quotes. <clears throat> but it's late. And my head hurts trying to think about how this team is the third best statistical team in the conference in defensive efficiency, but I digress. Fellas, as always, I love spending this time with you guys. I appreciate all that you bring to the show. 
I'm sure our listeners and subscribers appreciate it. Hey, you out there listening, subscribing, make sure you subscribe to the show, rate, review us, let us know how great you are. You could end up like Major Jeffrey Donaldson and have a special dinner with me tonight because that's that's valuable for Inside Carolina subscribers is rare opportunities to eat in public with me. It's more of a punishment, right? Anyway, subscribe, rate, review us. We appreciate it. Shout out to Major Jeff Donaldson. Uh, and thank you all for listening to this show this evening. It's been a special edition of the Coast to Post Game podcast featuring not Tommy Ashley, not Dewey Burke, but Sherelle McMillan and Sean Moran. Boys, thank you so much. Uh, for Sherelle, for Sean, I'm Joey Powell. We'll catch you next time on the next InsideCarolina.com podcast. Late.